people or maybe you guys watching the recording. We have a lot of people also watching recordings. That's also appreciated. So good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining today's call. We have a very special guest, Mr. Ralph. We will do the intro in a, just a minute. I think he's from Crypto Valley, famous place in, in Europe. I'm here together co-hosting with my friend Gordon Einstein. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Sander de Bruin. I'm from Amsterdam in the Netherlands. I'm involved in the blockchain crypto industry for just a couple of years. I'm not a techie, but I'm more of a marketeer. And besides my interest in blockchain and crypto, I'm also involved in the well-being and nutrition market. Um, but enough said on that. Gordon, many people ask me, where is Gordon this week? In the in, in, Where in the world are you? Are you in LA? Are you in Dubai? Are you in crypto? Uh, at the Bali? moment, I'm in Los... Well, good morning, Sandra. Good to see you. Uh, at the moment, I'm in Los Angeles. I'm in the actually the Hollywood Roosevelt Hotel. Very fancy schmancy. Um, I'm here for about two weeks. Then I'm off to Chicago. Then I think I'm off to Dubai and Switzerland. I think that's like going to be my 21, 22. So life, life is in motion. Um, anyways, everyone, we're, we're glad to be back here for Crypto Wednesdays. We got a nice group forming here. Um, very nice. And I want to just kind of get right into it. We're going to have our usual format, which is going to speak to our guest, who I'll introduce in a moment, or I'll let him introduce himself. In a moment, uh, we'll go back and forth with some questions and some discussions, and then we're going to open it up to the audience uh, for general Q&A challenges and everything else. Uh, my, my usual comment, of course, is that if you're a Zoom bomber, I will dispose of you with glee, literally with glee. So, you know, you can do your Nigerian dancing, whatever. You can do this, you can do that. I will just take off your manhood and, and remove you. And it's a, it's a sport for me. So just, you know, hey, listen, just I don't want to fear with your self-expression, but just, you know, what's coming. Uh, Ralph, take yourself off mute. Say yeah. hello. Good morning. How are you? Good afternoon on my side. Um, good. good afternoon. Uh, I, I'm not going to ask you your last name. I'm learning it myself. So say it for the group. Introduce yourself. Uh, Glabishnik is my last name. The name comes from the south of Austria, by the way. So uh, a little bit difficult, but uh, Ralph is absolutely fine for me. Yeah. Ralph Glabischnik, yes? You know, okay. I, I learned your German now, so you can you to me say, you remember that? Uh, a former German counselor said that? So, um. uh, well, there you go. Uh, yeah, I'm German now. So I, I, need, I need to like, you know, learn all this stuff immediately, obviously. So R Ralph, you, you and I had the pleasure to meet in Dubai and you know, I I heard about you before, but to see you in, in action was really something special. Uh, you're a very dynamic individual. You got a lot going on. You've, I think, to a certain extent, obviously working with others, but are largely responsible for, you know, being the entrepreneurial thing of creating something from nothing, and that that always you know takes work and takes time, and takes vision, and takes focus. Um, what I always like to do with our guests is analogized to the Marvel movies, you know, Wolverine and the rest of them, you always have an origin tale. So b before we get into your current, you know, Crypto Valley and everything else, we, you know, I think we'd love to learn something about you. So, you know, you're, you're a superhero. Tell us the origin tale, you know, just, just give us the backstory. Yeah. And I, I hand the microphone to you and I reserve the right to interrupt at any moment. <laughs> great, great. No, and, thank you for the uh, chance. Like, just for the audience, cheers. Where's your beverage? Uh, Where's your beverage? Cheers. I can a guy. I like it. Anyways, go for it. So I'm, as said before, I'm originally Austrian. Um, I grew up in Corinthia. I grew up in Corinthia in the south of Austria and um, left uh, the place when I was 20. Um, for my education, I'm a software developer with a little bit of economics behind. So uh, I started with assembler programming, COBOL programming, Java programming. That helps me today to understand a little bit what's happening in this blockchain world. But I, I finished uh, software development 15 years ago, so I'm not a good software developer today, um, but I can smell bullshit and that helps a little bit. And, um, yeah. On the other side, uh, I, I started in 1998 uh, as, a, as a consultant for a consulting company and started with digital transformation projects 
in banks and insurance and uh, understood that there's a lot of things to do to make them uh, more more digital, digital only, more interesting at the end of the day. And um, I did this until 2009. And in mm -hmm. 2005, I moved from Germany to Switzerland to a little boring city called Zug. Uh, <laughs> and some guys of you heard about Zug before. It's... Um, no, I'm going to do my first interruption. This is in 2005? In 2005, I moved to Zug. So, um, did Zugi even exist then? Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm you kidding. Know, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm when I'm in Zug, I say Zug is a part of Zurich, only the Zug people don't like that. But mm -hmm. if you look at on a global level, you're in 25 minutes from Zurich to Zug, and it's a city with 30,000 people. And I moved there in 2005 because what I always like to have a view to a lake for my flat. I, I grew up on a on a lake and I wanted to have the water, the lake next next to me. And uh, I had projects in Zurich and Lucerne. So I moved in this at this time infamous Crypto Valley in 2005. Yeah. And yeah. I learned something special about Zug because Zug at this time has been already a commodity valley. I don't know if most of you guys are familiar with that, but there are some very big companies called Glencore and Xarta and so on. And there was a guy uh, called Mark Rich and Mark Rich yeah. kicked off this commodity business in Zug, Switzerland. And um, this has been in the 70s and 80s. And Zug was open enough to not be afraid to foster this new opportunity. Uh, and that's the special DNA of Zug when something new is coming up. Um, a lot of people are afraid of the new thing, but Zug was open enough to allow it and to do that. So uh, I opened up my first company in Zug in 2009. Mm -hmm. The company still exists. It, it's called Inacta. Inacta is a digital transformation company in Switzerland, having 80 employees, uh, still trying to get insurances, banks, real estate companies into the digital world. Uh, and still uh, paying my bills at the end of the month. Let's take it from the simple side. Uh, and I'm running in ACTA as a CEO and as co-founder uh, with my partner, Marco. I have a Swiss partner in my group of companies. He's called Marco Bumbacher. He grew up in Zug and it's, that's even more rare to find someone who is born and grew up in Zug. And, mm -hmm. and we, started, we started this company in 2009 uh, by accident in the same year when the Bitcoin white paper has been written, but uh, no connection there, no OG on the 2009 level. Um, but um, yeah, being in tech at this time. And then our, our IT company, consulting company in ACTA grew very nicely. And in 2013, we opened up a business center in Zug. And this business center is called Lakeside Business Center. And uh, and after a few months, we had blockchain companies knocking on the door of this business center and asking, where's the crypto valley? Uh, and um, the first companies in Switzerland to form the crypto valley have been Lücke and Bitcoin Swiss. Uh, uh, Bitcoin Swiss, very successful today. Um, one of the biggest players in Switzerland. Um, um, I'm a small shareholder, just uh, to be open on that. And they, they have been key to grow this crypto valley. And the very special thing what happened is that the Ethereum boys went to Zug, that, uh, right. that Vitalik came to Zug, and um, the guy who is responsible for that is basically Michael Lise. I don't know who of you guys know Michael. He's a Romanian guy, uh, the only of the founders of the Ethereum Foundation who is still in Zug, who is still living there, working on his Akasha project uh, in a very quiet and decent way, but I'm sure it's going to be big. And he was the guy who did the location scouting for Ethereum and was looking for which is a good place to go 
and build probably something which is going to distract um, the whole financial industry and others. And yeah, we got in touch there. Um, we, we got in touch with MME, with Luca Muller, who is the guy responsible for the model of the foundations behind mm -hmm. the big blockchain protocols. Then Cardano came, Charles was already from the beginning there, Tezos came, Polkadot is there, and all the big foundations which we have in Switzerland. And, and we thought, hey, that's a great opportunity. Um, we are not the early movers, but we can support the early movers in two. And we named the part of the Lakeside Business Center, Lakeside Crypto Lab, and we invited startups in the blockchain space to join us. Uh, and after a few months, we had 30 companies in the blockchain space in our Lakeside Crypto Lab. And, and we recognized, hey, there's really something happening here in Zoom. And, um, and we grew into 2016. Um, we started the blockchain competition in in 2015, we started the competition in insurance and blockchain. We gave out a prize money of 100,000 US dollar for the best idea in blockchain and insurance worldwide. Mm -hmm. We got applications at this time from 35 countries, around 130 applications. And for the final event, we have been thinking, what should we do? Yeah, let's have a small event with 200 people. And then the final event was an event with 1,000 people because we have been in the full crypto craze with, with the ICOs at this time. And uh, I re remember crazy Russian people uh, coming in our office and say, I pay you 2,000 euro or 5,000 euro for a ticket for this event. And we just wanted to do a small thing, but came into a, into a big thing. Uh, this well, time. it's hard to say no when Russians walk in with $5,000 for a ticket. Yeah, you know, we, R have rough crazy, life. we have been crazy enough to say no, because yeah. we're good Swiss people and the fire police said it's not allowed to have more there. For the next event, we learned and we kept some tickets back for the crazy Russians walking in. Uh, mm -hmm. so, crazy, and, crazy Russians are the spice of life. Right, right. And, uh, you know, we, we named the Blockchain Summit um, uh, in 2016. Then we did several of these blockchain summits and... We said, okay, we want to do different things. So with Inacta and the consulting company, we, we try to help big corporates to get into the blockchain space. Um, with, with Lakeside Partners, we started to invest into that, our own money uh, mm -hmm. um, on equity and token-based. Um, with the Lakeside Crypto Lab, we said, let's do a, instead of Lakeside Crypto Lab, uh, Crypto Valley Labs, which is... Uh, in the background of my picture, you see the Crypto mm -hmm. Valley Lab, the Genesis Hub in Zug. We have there 2,500 square meter and 130 companies in the blockchain space. There's the headquarter of Tezos Foundation, of Cardano Foundation, of Lusk, of Waves, and, and many more. And um, we said, okay, let's, let's foster this ecosystem, do events. We... We started the CV Maps in Switzerland. CV Maps is categorizing all the blockchain startups in Switzerland. We have now 960 companies in Switzerland working in that space, uh, uh, with nearly 5,000 people working in that space. Uh, we opened up a Crypto Valley Labs in um, in Liechtenstein, mm -hmm. and one of the last things was opening up that uh, Crypto Valley Labs in Dubai in DMCC. And uh, uh, it looks like an overnight success in Dubai because we have more than 700 applications there. But the overnight success was three years working before with DMCC. How should we do that? And, right. um, and so we have the consulting business. We have this ecosystem, the Crypto Valley Labs. On top of the ecosystem, we built a venture capital firm called Crypto Valley Venture Capital. Uh, uh, we invested in the last three years in, I think, 35 projects now. We want to invest in 200 projects with CVVC. And we started off in Acta Ventures, a venture building company. And we built six companies, or we started to build six companies in the last years. 
some of them you might know. One is Inner Pay, one is Token Gate, uh, one is Chen2. Um, I know a lot of people on the call right now are working with different of us. So mm -hmm. um, we're building infrastructure for that ecosystem at the end of the day. Yeah. Most of the times you don't recognize that the companies are connected together because I personally believe in small teams. I like having teams less than 20 uh, working on one topic that uh, keeps it efficient instead of having big corporates at the end of the day. So how did you, how did you become, well, number one, wow. <laughs> and I guess a bunch of questions, just, just on a personal level, that seems like it would require a huge amount of energy and focus over time. Are you just an energizer bunny or is it you're naturally enthusiastic or how do you, how do you get all this done? You know, I'm for sure I'm a crazy workaholic, first of that. I mean, I'm staying here in, uh, in, in Greece and I'm on holidays and I'm for sure 10 hours a day in any calls, meetings, Telegram chats or whatever. So this is working on a low level for me. And yeah. uh, on the other side, I mean, if you smell that what's happening in the blockchain space, and I had the, the chance to smell it in 2013, 2014, get really into it in 2015, 2016, mm. uh, you can't get out of that if you are interested in what's happening out of the world. It's, it's just so many super interesting things. And I think it's, it's a once in a lifetime chance. You know, in, in November 2017, I had a call uh, with an US number um, and the guy on the, on the phone was a guy called David Sachs. Uh, mm -hmm. And he said, hey, Ralph, um, I'm, I heard about Crypto Rally and I want to invite you to a lunch. Do you have time on Friday? And I said, of course, if there's a free lunch, I'm always in, uh, come over. And then David came with his team to us to Switzerland and I had no clue who he was, but I Googled and then I read something about uh, the PayPal mafia and Peter Thiel and so on. And the guys took their private chat and their time to come to Zoop to see what's happening. And this mm -hmm. was November, 2017. And this was for me a tipping point when I thought, okay, there's really something special going on here. If these guys move their ass, out of the US in this small boring soup in Switzerland, we should have a closer look what's happening. That's, yeah, that's, that's an interesting kind of social proof. The, and just from, this kind of related to my life personally, it sounds like people actually, and sorry if this sounds naive, it, it sounds like people actually live in Zug and do stuff. It's not just a mailing address. I mean, is there, are there, can you describe that, life in Zoog? No, that, that's really, that's really true. I mean, Zoog is, um, it's a place with a high quality to live. And uh, um, we, for example, have 150 people working for us in Zoog in different companies. Um, the people don't live only in Zoog, they live also partly in Zurich or, or somewhere around in Switzerland. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but for me, I mean, I'm Austrian, I lived seven years in Germany. I really love to live in Switzerland, in Zug. I mean, it's super open. You can talk to the government, you can talk with the tax administration and you're like a, a customer there and not like a um, victim. Yeah. And on the other side, you have a, a great quality of living there in terms of nature, in terms of um, international city, we have around 40% of people in Zug not from Switzerland. So it's a very international city. This, the city of Zug has 34,000 people living there and, mm. and has, I think, more than 20 billionaires there and a few hundred with more than 100 million. Uh, it's the only city beside Monaco I know with this size which has a Ferrari dealer and a Bentley dealer there. And, uh -huh. and, that's, and that was the Swiss people who are usually low key. Uh, I mean, our last project, what we did is 
uh, we opened in Zug the so-called Czech Club. The Czech Club is the private business club on, on 1,500 square meter. We did a cigar lounge, bar, private restaurant, wine bar, event hall, and so on. And people said, that's crazy that you do that. And I said, I want something similar like the Arts Club in, in Dubai or in London and so on. And mm -hmm. uh, in, immediately I got 20 founding partners. And now we have already 350 members in this club. And it's really a cool atmosphere. And it brings together the local two guys plus the international guys. And uh, I was keen on not having a crypto club. I wanted to have a club which brings all the industries together. You know, for example, Siemens is having one of the headquarters, or one of the three headquarters worldwide in Zug. Johnson mm -hmm. & Johnson is having a big headquarter in Zug and doing blockchain projects at the moment. Um, we have Novartis and Drosch there. So we have a lot of big corporates on a worldwide scale, also in, in this little, small, growing town. Interesting. Now, you, you mentioned Mark Rich, and I, of course, I, I remember, as an American, I remember him from the Clinton pardon, you know, back back in the 90s or so, and then that back and forth. But, you know, I, separate from whether he got a, a bad shake or not, what you're implying or what I think I heard is Zoo has been open-minded towards this kind of business or towards innovative models for a long time. And Absolutely. you're, well, I, I think I'm hearing an inherent contrast with maybe some other cantons, not that other cantons are bad, but something unique about Zook. When, when, did they, when did they acquire this mentality or do you have any sense of how they acquired this mentality? Yeah. You know, in, in the 70s, uh, Zook was still a, a village of farmers. And what is very special in Switzerland and what makes a lot of success in Switzerland is the tax system. It's a decentralized tax system. That means mm -hmm. every canton is able to decide about their taxes. And Zu decided in, in the 70s, let's have low taxes for people and for corporates. Mm -hmm. And with that, they started to attract a lot of international companies. And I mean, uh, Mark Rich, the company Glencore, employs yeah. 1,200 people today in Zu. And they make a gross revenue of $150 billion a year. So these companies are huge. Uh, another company which is very uh, famous is, is Partners Group in Zug. That's like KKR and BlackRock, one of the five biggest private equity companies worldwide. Uh, yes. um, the founders of Partners Group are billionaires now, and they use Zug as well, and they... They have, I think, as well around 800 or 900 people working in Zug. So it's not, you can't com compare it with, with Cyprus or with Malta or so, where you probably put your company there, but mm. not really something is going on. Um, in Zug, there's also substance, and that's what I like. And, and for me personally, um, I'm also resident in Dubai, and the combination of Zug and Dubai is just a perfect combination. Um, I, actually, you, you anticipated my next question or, or topic. The, explain, you know, here you are in Europe, here we are in Switzerland and Liechtenstein and, you know, sort of, you know, I, I hear you referred to maybe as the DAC countries. I, I think that's a new term for me. But, uh, and then all of a sudden you're showing your, hat, your handsome face in Dubai and setting up a branch there. That's that's quite the move. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, behind the move is a long story. I came the first time in 1998 to Dubai. Uh, and in 1998, there wasn't a lot there. So, um, and, and, but at this time, they built on the Dubai Internet City and the Dubai Media City. Yeah. Um, five stories tall buildings. And I was wondering, what are they going to do there? What's, what's going to happen there? Why should someone come there and set up shop in Dubai? Huh? So, okay. Um, and this is 1998. This 1998. Quite some time ago. And, oh. and then I followed up nearly every year there in my holidays because I liked it. And I call Dubai the biggest bat in the world. Huh? Because they just built infrastructure 
uh, with when you look from the outside, having no clue who is going to use that. Mm-hmm. But but there's a clue who's going to use that, and I really like to compare big blockchain projects with Dubai. Uh, what is Ethereum, Cardano, Tezos, and so on? What are they building? They are building an infrastructure. That's uh, a very clever analogy. Uh, That's a very and, clever analogy. Yeah, and, I got it. And <laughs> we don't know who is using this infrastructure at the moment, which will mm. be the successful project on that infrastructure. Uh, and similar to Dubai, you have to give the project a benefit when you come there. Uh, rather do you give subventions or you make it tax-free or mm. you make it interesting to live there and funny to live there. And you try to attract as lot of people as possible to use your infrastructure. And Dubai has been very smart with that. I mean, you know, I, I met a lot of people in Dubai and they tried to build my, my network in Dubai during the last 20 years. Um, in the last five years, I intensified that. And the bullshit level is nowhere bigger than in Dubai. So first you have to cut out 90% of that what you hear. And then you have to get down to the real people delivering stuff and working there. Mm. And for example, what I'm not mainly interested in is doing government projects. Uh, I like to meet people in Dubai, other entrepreneurs and working with them together. Mm -hmm. Uh, And... um, so for me, it was always a target. I want to do something in Dubai. I want to establish something there. And a few years ago, I met James Bernard from DMCC, who sits today in the Netherlands, so not far from you, Sandra, I assume. But, and James, uh, he shared my vision. And I have been looking for a partner in Dubai, and I talked to, or in the UAE, and they talked to DIFC, to DMCC, and to ADGM. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to find someone with whom we can build a, a huge thing over there. And, and DMCC and Ahmed bin Sulayem uh, ha- have been my go-to um, free zone because I really like the mindset behind. And you, you should look at behind DMCC and behind Ahmed Ahmed started this thing off in, I think, in 2002 or three or four or something like yeah. that. And now there are 19,000 companies, more than 100,000 people there. And, and he had the biggest growth last year in 2020. And this is another speciality of Dubai. When the whole world locked down, Dubai checked quickly in June, July, or let's say April to June, what's happening, opened up in July and opened really up in September. And since then, Dubai is the only place in the world where you can do business as usual. Or uh, pretty close to as usual. (laughs) Yeah. Nearly. I'm I'm telling you, compared to Los Angeles, it's heaven. Like when when I can't, it's... Yeah, it's a, it's a whole different story. It's clean, it's efficient, they're nice. The police uh, I, are nice. I, mean, <laughs> yeah. uh, I don't agree fully with it's efficient, but we can talk about that off, off, offline. But, you know, it's, it's quite simple. Dubai has another model. The, the government owns the infrastructure. Mm-hmm. And you think twice to lock down the infrastructure you own. In Europe, yeah. the government or the politicians are usually owning nothing. So when they lock down the infrastructure, Mm -hmm. uh, they always weight more the risk than the opportunity. And and in Dubai, they have to make another decision. Uh, They have to say, should we shut down our our airline? Should we shut down our airports? Should we shut down our hotels? our event infrastructure, our everything. And so they, they take decisions on another level. And um, yeah, I personally like that. Um, uh, that's, a, that's a clever comment. Um, and, and I guess on efficiency, I, I meant for my personal services and personal life. 
I don't know if in the back end and in, in, in the, I mean, to the extent I say, <laughs> you, you, you kind of waved a red flag in front of me when you said take it offline. So now I don't want to. Uh, just to extend your comfortable, what, what do you mean? Um, how efficient was it to get your bank account in Dubai? Oh, you know what? I haven't done that yet. Okay, let's talk afterwards. Okay, good. Um, that, 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 that was a very pregnant moment there. Okay. Well, you know what? I don't know. Actually, is it, maybe my maybe German passport will help. I guess we'll, or maybe it doesn't. I, I don't know. I guess we'll find out. No, you know, there's a lot of things are efficient in Dubai, and some other things are, yeah, still there's some room for improvement. But, um, but you know, I, I like. Dubai as well as a place which is very safe. Yeah? Yeah. And there, there are two um, ways you get it safe. There's the way of Switzerland to have it grassroots safe. It's grown uh, and it's grassroots safe. And there's another way like Dubai, it's a top-down safety. Uh? But the result is quite similar. Uh? We can walk around in Dubai and we are not afraid of anything. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And I have another, another personal vision um, or macro vision. When you look at the, at the planet right now, um, what's going to happen? Yeah? The last 30 years, we saw the, the cities and in every city we had a part which was for the richer, for the entrepreneurs, for the successful managers and so on. And, and what we see right now, um, we see this on a global level. Uh, mm -hmm. We see people moving to places where you feel safe. Uh, yeah. I mean, if you have small kids, and I have three of them, um, if you choose between South America or Dubai, it's quite clear where you go. If you say, do I go to Jayburg or do I go to Dubai, it's quite clear where I go. So. I want safety every day. Yeah? And with all the things happening on the world and probably an upcoming economic crisis, this, is, this will accelerate. Uh, I mean, I have friends last year uh, in Mexico, they came in a shooting after a few weeks of lockdown because they got robbed there. And um, so you think twice if you want to go there. We know a lot of stories of people in the crypto area um, who got kidnapped, similar things, but right. that didn't happen in Switzerland, that didn't happen in Dubai, that didn't happen in Singapore. But there are only a few places worldwide where you really can be free by yourself. Huh? Right. And, and this is a strong argument for these countries. I mean, if you and your family feel safe, uh, you will bring yourself and your business there at the end of the day. And when Fair you enough. see what's, what's happening in, in UK, I have a lot of friends, they say to me, hey, Ralph, I don't want to live anymore in Notting Hill. Yeah, it's not safe anymore. Talk to people who lived in, in France, in Paris. They're leaving Paris, it's not safe anymore. Uh, Germany, we say a we see a movement there, and and I think this is going to accelerate, especially when we run into a into an economic crisis, which, in my simple opinion, will come up in the next few years. I, th I think you're right. So let me shift a little bit. So crypto value to buy. What is what? What's your main mission? And then if you're successful, what does it look like in say two years? Like, how do we know it worked? And what, what's, what's it? And then how do we know it worked? Um, you know, I have always a um, philosophy to try to build an ecosystem. The ecosystem is, is the CV labs. And I try to attract as many companies, uh, corporates, investors, universities, uh, the whole ecosystem into the CV labs to get them together, to work together. Uh, and, and on top of the CV labs, I built my own businesses. Uh, 
I explain it a bit like that. I, I like to own the soccer field to see mm. the good players playing on the soccer field. And then either I can recruit the players for me, I can invest into the players, yeah, or I can build new teams. And so Crypto Valley Labs is kind of a non-profit business for me. And what are the KPIs, if it's successful or not? Um, when we will have 100 companies in the Crypto Valley Labs next year, then it's always successful for me. In, you know, in Dubai? In Dubai. Uh, you know, right. in Switzerland, the, the whole numbers are, we started from 30 companies when we started to count to 960 companies today. And from these 960 companies, around 300 companies are in buildings which we are running. Uh, so right. one third of the ecosystem is is in our in our uh, it's on your soccer field. Yeah, in our <laughs> soccer. Field. Yeah, right. Thank you. And and in Dubai, we will come out with the Crypto Valley Maps Dubai most likely in September this year. Uh, and why do we do this Crypto Valley Maps? Um, it's not only about Dubai; it's also about the UAE. Uh, we try to categorize all companies in the area. How many are there? What's the growth? What's going on? How many people are working there? That's a good KPI for me to see the growth of an ecosystem. And I think you have been at our last event at the Billionaires in, in Dubai. And I said, I want to- yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll even be more generous than that. So you guys were, that was an amazing event, extremely well produced. You were clearly beyond capacity, but not to the danger zone. And you and Joseph Holm were nice enough to basically sneak me in there when it was extremely difficult to do so. And I had a great time and I met a ton of people and it was just a, a, a classy, nice scene. And having, you know, believe me, I had a good time in Dubai, but to have a good time where it's quality is not always the case. And that was really well, nicely done. So yes, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a pump on that. Thank you, thank you. Um, and what I said on stage there was, um, I believe that we could have more than 1,000 companies in the blockchain space mm -hmm. until end of 2022. Which is pretty soon. Yeah, this is 18 months. So, um, and I think the opportunity is there. Um, we will see some, some issues in in the world, I believe in an autumn winter again. Uh, well, and, issues like COVID lockdown, issues yeah, like economic. I mean, I have no clue. I'm nothing in that, but I have the gut feeling we will some issues. We will see some issues again. And sure. And and uh, you know what? What an ecosystem um, is really core of is three things, three pillars. An ecosystem is about infrastructure, and Dubai is world class in physical infrastructure. Yeah? And there's also regulatory infrastructure needed, and Dubai is building that right now. The ESCA, the DFSA, they are building that. Yeah? The, the second thing you need is capital. Mm -hmm. Dubai has a lot of capital, not Dubai itself, but the region and the, 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 the Emirates, let's say. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, also Saudi and so on. Mm. And the third thing is you need talent. No? You need the smart people. And you know what changed the last 15 months in Dubai? I have met so many smart people telling me I came to Dubai for one week. This was six months ago. No? Mm. Uh, and Gordon, you're one of them, if I remember that right. So yeah. Uh, no, a lot of... Uh, I was being bashful because he says smart people, but, but yeah, yes, I came in there in December just for, for, because of some personal stuff. was like, wow. Uh, came back in January and barring some small trips in the middle, six months that changed my life and I'm going back there and to be your neighbor in Switzerland in two weeks. I mean, this is a, a complete 180 on everything I was doing before. So future Crypto Wednesdays will not be at 5.30 a.m. my time. Thank God. <laughs> But yeah, nice. Dubai, Dubai is the airport lounge. You don't want to leave. 
No, I mean, really, I believe Dubai has all the ingredients to be on top of, of our crypto world. Uh, and what I would like to do is I would like to connect everyone, uh, like we did it at our last two events, to bring them together and, and to grow this ecosystem we have. Uh, and um, so I'm, I'm open... You know, I'm not a Bitcoin maximalist. I'm not a Ethereum boy. Uh, I'm not the Charles Hoskinson follower. I, I think this, this thing, what we are building together, this is going to be so big. And we are now around 1994 or 1995 in the internet area. So uh, it's going to be huge. And when we stop talking about what the technology is, and start talking about the applications, then it's going to change. Uh, and I still believe we take, or we need five to ten years more. Uh, right. And I'm already a few years into that, and uh, I'm still I'm getting older, but I still got a lot of energy to put it into that. And okay, don't say that. I think you're younger than I am. I'm pretty sure. I'm so. I'm not totally sure, but um, I first I'm turning fifty two this week. 52 this week. Yeah. Congrats. Yeah. Yeah. So remember, we got high energy, my friend. <laughs> yeah. Congrats. No, I mean, uh, I really, the, the energy this, this space is giving to me and this, this opportunity is giving to me, that's huge. You know, one of the biggest successes we had in Switzerland the last years was that, that the Libra Foundation, yeah. uh, the project of Facebook, was set up in Geneva, was set up in Switzerland. Uh, this was taking something from Silicon Valley to Crypto Valley. Uh, of course, I have to be honest, it didn't succeed. They took it back this year, but it was a step to get out some of the power of, of the US and decentralize this power. And I think when we all work on that to get the opportunity to decentralize stuff um, and power and financing and opportunities, uh, then we did a good job. Uh, we didn't do a good job when we uh, are the fastest industry ever, which is wealth accumulating on a few hundred people. Uh, that's not decentralizing uh, power and financial power. Um, so. I, I don't let, like... let me pause that because that, that's actually a very interesting point. The, right. In, in order for decentralization to actually get decentralized, you need a lot of people involved. Right. It, it just can't be some elite talking amongst them, themselves. I like, I I like mean, that. You know, you should, should have a look. I, I don't know if you remember this post when Binance did the a huge profit and then there was the there have been the post on social media binance compared to deutsche bank mm. uh, and everyone celebrated wow binance is making more profit than deutsche bank and uh, and mm. has less than i don't know 1000 people at this time and so and i mean this is the opposite side from that what we want to reach a company which is doing so much money in a short time uh, and profit, which is centralized at the end of the day. Uh, mm -hmm. I think our opportunity must be to decentralize that. And uh, I believe the technology is there, the opportunity is there. Um, we have to take care a little bit about that. And uh, the combination out of Switzerland and Dubai is for me personally perfect. Interesting. So let, let me... So let me tell everyone in the audience, we're going to head into the second part of the show very soon where we open it up to the audience and you will get a special opportunity to ask questions to Ralph and, and talk with them. And we have a lot of alumni speakers on there. So just if you have questions or uh, want to ask things, start putting your name in the chat and we'll, we'll kind of queue it up. And Sandra, maybe you can help me with that a bit. But Ralph, b before we get to that section of the show, you, you kind of led into the next question, which is... You, you talked about your vision for CV Labs the next couple of years. So what's your vision 
for the technology as a, a whole? How do we know if the tech, what is the, what should it accomplish in the next couple of years? And how do we know that it worked? Like it's the end of 2023. What, what am yeah. I looking at? Probably end of 2023 is a little bit early. But oh, 20, 2025, I say end of 25. What am I looking at? I, I want to to take this whole thing in two in two steps. Um, okay. One thing is we are building a new financial system, a new financial industry, uh, and this new financial system, new financial industry is already quite far off. Uh, uh, we saw Coinbase in the U.S. We mm -hmm. see like Kraken, who will be and so on. You name it, how they are working. Uh, um, I personally believe when the blockchain space is only creating a new financial system, then we didn't succeed. Uh, okay. I I'm really looking forward into use cases which are outside of the financial industry. So not that the financial industry is bad on that side. I mean, uh, I'm investing myself in tokenization and all this stuff, but you know what's really interesting is self sovereign identity, uh, moving IP rights. When, when our um, Napster 4.0 is token-based, then we have succeeded. When okay. YouTube 4.0 is token based without talking about that, but how we share the revenues behind that, how we share revenues in in education. In okay, so I, I'm going to totally interrupt. Are, are you at all concerned about censorship or the re repressive effect on some forms of speech that come from centralized media? Or do you steer, do you steer clear, clear of that topic? Or what are your feelings? Because you mentioned a little pet peeve of mine that you may not share. You know, of, of course, I'm, I'm worried about how media works today, uh, uh, how professional media works today. But also I'm worried about how social media works today. Yeah? Mm -hmm. You put out the wrong message and the mass takes it and takes it as true. Uh, so yeah. uh, we need also there to have a balanced system to to rate and to to rate stuff and to get the stuff really uh, really on a good level at the end of the day. And and you know we always talk about privacy and we don't want to give our data and when you don't pay for a service you're the product and we know all that stuff. Uh, but every one of us is using Google every day. Everyone, mm -hmm. or not everyone, but a lot of one of us are using Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and so on, and are not paying for that services. So on one side, we say, oh, it's bad. They collect our data. They make money out of that. On the other side, we use it uh, for our daily business. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, I think the awareness on that is not super high. I mean, uh, last year I organized an event uh, at the World Economic Forum and had Brittany Kaiser there and we talked with her about all this stuff. And I mean, you know, it's crazy. You look in, into that, what's happening there, but basically we are not changing really anything. Okay, fair enough. And, and I, I kind of I kind of took you on tr off track, and I apologize. So, Vision twenty, you know, Ralph, Vision twenty twenty five. Go on. Ralph, Vision twenty twenty five is five more years to have my vision ready. That's main twenty thirty. Uh, <laughs> okay, I, fine. Ralph, Vision twenty thirty. Tell us. Ralph, Vision twenty thirty. Um, we will have the Internet of Value. Uh, so moving values in all different levels will be tokenized. Uh, and levels will be music, IP rights, videos, real estate, my watch, whatever. We will have tokenized this stuff. And you know what the most complex value is to tokenize? Ourselves. 
Yeah. Okay. Uh, so having us in a way with an electronic identity where we control the data behind and where we say, okay, I, I control my data. I have my ad identity self serving and I tell you, the bank, when you're allowed to use it, you, the insurance company, when you're allowed to use it, you, the government, when you're allowed to use it. And this is the vision for 2040. 40, 4 zero. 4 zero. Until also we as people will be tokenized in a, in a realistic way. That's interesting. That, that kind of dovetails with a bunch of other technologies that will... Oh, maybe open up a lot of things. Brooke, hold on one second, then tell yours. Actually, you know, I'll, I'll switch it. Okay, we're going to go to the, the the portion of the show where we engage our wonderful audience. And Ralph, it, it, it's perfect that you mentioned self sovereign identity because that is a topic that's near and dear to our our who's a gentleman who's practically our co-host. He's been so dedicated and so on on the ball. So Marco, please uh, uh, mute yourself and yes, you can do video. If it makes you happy and and go, and go for it and w welcome and welcome back. Thank you. Hi, Hi Barry. Uh, so I didn't put a shirt on for this, Gordon. Sorry. It, it's uh, okay. We'll, we'll live. Uh, so your, uh, I mean, I agree with you. One of the, I I, I view the the. The, the ecosystem you're describing coming up in your vision, um, uh, the Internet of Value, is an interesting proposition because it is something that I, I, I suspect that would be the best way to put it, will be adamantly opposed by almost every power that is currently in existence. Simply because it, it will decentralize everything, which means you're now in a position where you have to reevaluate how do you tax that? How do you market to that? Uh, the, the concept of self-sovereign identity is as one example, uh, which I've actually decided I, I want to rename it. I don't want to call it identity. I want to call it accountability. Uh, but decentralized accountability, where you have the, you have the uh, immutable uh, way of communicating your accountability within a transaction of any kind, whether that's a comment you post on Facebook or, you know, me buying your watch from you. Uh, the accountability is assured by cryptographic infrastructures that we're building today. Uh, when, when we do that, we create a world where uh, things that we think of as just normal today aren't possible. You can't lie at all. It's impossible to lie. Uh, it's impossible to spin something because the facts are disclosed and known, or at least they're disclosable and knowable. And if you choose not to disclose them, you literally stop yourself from being able to transact because you've got this accountability infrastructure in place that says that if I'm going to give you, uh, you know, one Bitcoin and you're going to give me your Patek Philippe, that's a good deal. But you have to give me the Patek Philippe, and I have to actually give you the Bitcoin for this to work. If you don't, I got to carry that, and you've got to. If you or you and I both have to carry that transaction for the rest of our lives as a failed transaction, which suggests that in your case, because you didn't, I, maybe I delivered the Bitcoin and you didn't deliver the Patek Philippe. Aside from a lawsuit, uh, there's a record now, immutable, about you reneging on the deal. That you can't hide from because if someone says, hey, I want to know what your history is of doing deals with people. Please disclose the success rate of your last 500 deals, right? Just give me the number. What's your success rate? Right. And it turns out that you know, 94, they want to know why is there 6% bad. Marco, uh, uh, there, there are several layers in that, what you, what you are telling. And one layer, what I believe is... Um, the, the vision of total transparency is coming closer. So, um, you know, we have cameras more and more worldwide. 
we have AI to recognize people. Um, we, we get fined when we drive too fast, not because we get flashed, because our, our speed is measured on several kilometers. So, I mean, we, we have something, and I would put it like that, when technology allows us to do it, at the end of the day, we will do it. Uh, and you see this in China already today. Uh, I mean, I, I think you guys are familiar with that, that China has a rating system. When you pass a street, when it's red light, you already get fined automatically. Um, you're not allowed to buy train tickets then when your rating is down and so on and so on. So China shows what technology can do already today. Uh, and, and now we have to split our industry in, in two totally different things. One thing is what countries like China want to do with blockchain technology, what CBDCs are gonna be. And the other thing is what libertarian Bitcoin, Monero, uh, and so on transactions and projects are. Uh, and these things are so far away from each other. Um, yeah, and a lot of people don't get it. it. I mean, let's celebrate that China is doing a CBDC. Uh, um, mm -hmm. They control at the end of the day, the whole money flow. Uh, they control the taxes. They can freeze your money whenever you want. They can deduct your your fines in a second. So, you know, this is the total control what we have seen 20 years ago in science fiction movies. So, and and we see that today. And and I like to compare that with the with the frog in the water, and the water is slowly going hotter and hotter. Uh, the frog is not recognizing that. Uh, Interesting. Let, let me let me get uh, my friend Wasim on real quick. Wasim, uh, welcome. Hello, hello. Um, I just wanted to quickly ask you um, if you feel like the convergence of the different trends, being KYC identity and um, the proliferation of blockchain technology in accordance with certain regulations, um, will sort of take care of things in terms of locking in who's doing what I just because I came in a little bit late and it seems to me that things are converging but perhaps there are some hurdles or obstacles that we haven't thought about if you would please uh, comment on that and thank you very much thanks Wazim uh, who was putting the question in the room just to get a picture uh, Wazim yeah, my name is Wasim Mamluk. I am the VP of Capital Markets at Nimbus DeFi. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, you know, I, I fully believe yeah. that, K, that KYC and AML to a certain level is important. Uh, uh, there are only a few markets worldwide which are not KYC than the AML now. But the question is, what is the level of KYC AML you need? Uh, do you want to be KYC AML when you buy your coffee on, on the beach or when you buy uh, real estate for $500,000? Uh, right. And, um, and there are only a few industries in the world which are beside that. Uh, the art industry is one, one very good example. And the art industry fits also very good into that, what Marco explained before. Um, there's no transparency. So what the price of a piece of art is and what the real price is, what has been paid and so on, is super intransparent. Um, so I'm personally a friend of KYC AML to a certain level. But I also believe there should be some room for, for our freedom, for our personal freedom. And you know, in Switzerland, for example, we can pay up to 100,000 Swiss francs 
uh, around 100,000 US dollar without KYC AML. So 99,000 is fine in cash. Yeah? In, in China, that's probably 20 US dollar. Uh, so because no one takes cash there. And in the rest of Europe, it's around two and a half thousand euro, five thousand euro. So it's a little bit the question where to start with that, and what is what is a fair amount of KYC and AML. Now l l let me ask you. If, if I'm, I'm not necessarily. I, I, I have a fetish for privacy uh, because I think political space exists okay. within privacy. But to your point, to the extent that AML and KYC is an automated streamlined process that just is seamlessly operating in the background all the time because maybe that's where technology is taking us. Does that coffee versus real estate purchase distinction even matter anymore if it's just something that can happen instantaneously at almost no cost, if, it, if it's just omnipresent? Does it, does, it make, does it make sense in Ralph 2040 to maintain that distinction? It, it makes a lot of sense. I mean, you know, again, in, in my 2040 vision is mm -hmm. today we have a term of, of being a star, being famous. Huh? If you are famous, there are, uh, there are small countries in the world where you can walk around freely and you're mm -hmm. not disturbed by others. Huh? Let's take a person like Roger Federer. I'm a Swiss or living in Switzerland. He's mm -hmm. a famous tennis player. Roger yeah. Federer is able to go to a dinner in Zug, Switzerland, sit on a table without security, without anything around him. Uh, when he does the same in Dubai, it's as well possible. When he does the same, in, in South America, he needs security around him to, to be safe. When he does the same in Germany, he needs security around him to not be all the time disturbed by people to get an autograph. Uh, so there are different levels of, of privacy for stars. And why do you stars Switzerland to live? Because the people in Switzerland leave them alone. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, coming to my vision, I wear glasses today. Uh, I believe in a few years the Google Glass and the functionality will be in nearly every glass. Uh, so when I meet Sander de Bruyne anywhere, I see, oh, Sander is in venture capital. He's working with Ariel Ludi. He's probably. Uh, um, mm. a little bit more wealthy than other people around. Uh, and, you know, in, in South America, $5,000 or $10,000 are enough to go against someone because they want your money. So transparency makes people famous who haven't been famous today. Uh, if oh, that's you, an interesting comment. Yeah, and, and with that, that will change everything. I mean, when you're looking around and you see probably the estimated wealth of the people, uh, and is it worth to approach them or not? Uh, this will change a lot of things. Uh, and the real rich people on the planet, they try to stay infamous. Uh, but that's going to change. I wonder, if a, I wonder if a lot of people who are getting attention now will lose their attention once you really know what's going on with them. No. This is. This I'm, is I'm wondering whether things. that should be even allowed. Uh, you you can't, think about it from a privacy perspective. I fully agree with you, Marco, but the problem is you can't forbid it. It's just collecting data. It's sure, just collecting. It doesn't, data, it doesn't have to collect the data and then immediately tag it to a particular person or a picture of that person. You know, it could, it's, it could tag it to an, an, an identifying uh, algorithm of some kind. You know, a self-sovereign identity, for example, where all of your interactions are done under a different pseudonym from a technical perspective. 
You know, at the moment, I'm talking just about taking the data we have already together. Mm -hmm. huh? ah, in that case, yes, you were right. I'm, I'm, I'm not <laughs> talking about some new. It's just collecting the data from the internet today. Yeah? I mean, you know, you can take my picture. You can go in Switzerland into, into the company, which is the UC. Ralph is owner of 15 companies. Mm -hmm. This is public data today. You can collect that. No one can, can forbid you that. And you combine that data. And, you know, the joke, Gordon, when you wrote in the, in the WhatsApp chat, the famous Ralph. You know what I don't want to be? I don't want to be famous. Uh -huh. I uh, like my privacy. Can I ask a question about your 40 year vision again? <laughs> sure. Michael, your sound is very bad. It's. Yeah, uh, Marco, Mar you're echoing. And you know what? You and I have the same earpiece. So I got the one that you told me to get. I'm using it for the first time. So come on, buddy. And you, you sound amazing. Am I still echoey? A little bit, but uh, whatever. It's okay. Just go ahead. Just articulate. Uh, the, yeah. The, the question I have is uh, I've been sort of looking around. I'm a decentralist at heart. Let's put it that way. And I, I think the decentralization of accountability is one key thing. A lot of people call it identity, but I think it's much bigger than that. It's really about ac accountability. And then the decentralization of our monetary or value system is also critical to achieve what we might want to call the evolution of humanity. I've also added the decentralization of communication and the decentralization of energy as two other, I'll call them pillars of the next generation of humanity or the next evolution of humanity. Can you think of anything other than those four that would need to be decentralized uh, in order for, again, humanity to move almost to the Star Trek next generation model where the only thing that matters in your life is your reputation and everything is open to you so long as you maintain a good reputation? You know, I, I think... Oh, yeah, sorry, guys, I'm, I'm going to hijack one second. I, uh, Ralph, I, I, I want you to store that question in your mind. But we have our famous fellow attorney who Marco knows, Raphael Bauman, on the call. But I think you know Raphael, hopefully well. Raphael, thank you for joining. You're an awesome gentleman. I would want you to say hi, Ralph. And just if you've got any kind of comment or question or just anything to throw at him, now would be the moment. And I'm kind of I'm hijacking just because I know you have a second. So go. Thanks, Gordon. No, I just want to say quickly hi to Rolf, and uh, I could ask him uh, as many questions as I want because he's staying in Zug as I am, and uh, we will see we will see each other soon. <laughs> nice to see you, Rolf. Ciao, Rafael. Ciao, bye bye. Cool. Thanks, Rafael. Appreciate it. Oh, okay, Rolf. <laughs> so, in order to get to Marco's Star Trek Next Generation future, where you were in this reputation only system, I think the question was, what 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 else is the gap? You know, I think. It's always about accumulating power. And at the end of the day, you have to decentralize power again. What we have seen since 2000 something is accumulating power around the GAFA companies, Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon. Yeah? And when this growth is going on, one day you need to de you need to decentralize this power uh, and that's not only in the government way it's also on the corporate level it's on the financial level it's you know the the saying of too big to fail we yeah. heard that a few times uh, this too big to fail we will see that with china you know china is amazing what they achieve in the last 20 years to put people out of poverty. Probably a democratic system wouldn't get it there. But I believe personally, China will collapse because the political model will not work for all. And I also- it will, believe, it will, The country will collapse or the current mode of governance? Oh, be subject yeah, to like a shock reform. It's both together at the end of the day. It's a little bit like 
Uh, I had yesterday in the evening an interesting discussion on that with a, a gentleman I didn't knew before. It's a little bit like the Japan syndrome. Uh, the guys who are a little bit older, like you and me, Gordon, they remember hey. how everyone celebrated Japan in the in the beginning of the 90s and yeah. how everything is going on. And then we saw it's not going on gonna go on and and i mean in china we have a lot of smart people in china now being educated in europe in the us and so on and getting back to china they will not tolerate uh, this political system on a long journey yeah? and on the other side i mean yeah when you when you are 20 years in the internet or a bit more like i am you probably remember Alta Vista. Uh, that was our Alta Vista, engine. sure. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, of course. today, you go on Google. Uh, so Google knows more about myself than my wife does. And that's not good at the end of the day. I mean, we really. Well, it depends to... what you mean. Do you, do you actually want your wife to know more? That could be dangerous. <laughs> no, it's. Or it's do you just... want Google to know less? <laughs> I really want Google to know less. Okay. Because just imagine the power behind Google with the data they collect. Yeah? I mean, if people are starting to Google about an, any equity, any share, uh, Google knows, hey, the people are, are collecting more data about, let's say now their Apple shares. Yeah? Probably they are going to buy it. Yeah? So, and, and the amount of power a friend like Elon Musk has today is mm -hmm. just crazy. Yeah? So, too much power in the hand of a few never worked out in the history of the mankind. Right. It's always the question, what is the crisis to break that down? Yeah? And what is the... And invariably, it involves a civil war. <laughs> I mean, hey, you know, sometimes. Uh, 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 Doctor Professor Stephen Liu, can I get you on for a minute? One, two, one, two. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. And do we get to see your smiling face? My new uh, friend. Uh, 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 wait. I think. Uh, um, I don't really know how this. Uh, uh, well, that's that's smiley enough. I'm looking at my photograph, and it seems okay. Well, so, uh, take a moment to introduce yourself. You're you're a new friend of mine, you know, from Dubai, you're a smart gentleman. But just give us a give us a quick moment on yourself, and then say hi to Ralph and go for it. Sure, sure, okay. Yeah, it's my pleasure uh, to uh, to join this call. And uh, Ralph, thank you for uh, uh, organizing these uh, fantastic events. And I've uh, you know have had a, a real pleasure to uh, attend them and also to uh, to quickly chat with uh, Ralph. Uh, you know, uh, uh, on a couple of occasions, and it's a, it's a real honor uh, to be able to uh, uh, to join this call again. Um, so I had a couple of uh, couple of questions. One one I suppose segues into uh, the conversation that we're having, and uh, the other, uh, you know, is uh, is somewhat somewhat uh, tangential. But um, oh, that's right. You want me to introduce myself? Um, so uh, yeah, I was previously a professor of AI. At an institution out in, in in Beijing called Tsinghua, which is essentially a theater school to the uh, the well, I suppose the the elite that governs China. So what Ralph was saying about China is actually really quite um, you know uh, to the point, and it's also really interesting. Um, speaking of which, there I see an interesting sort of an irony there because, um, as everyone knows, you know uh, China is a highly centralized a sort of a, uh, a well, centralized, in, you know, um, it's a country that's governed by centralized institutions throughout, and um, mm. and the fact that they are embracing, you know, decentralization is really quite an interesting paradox. In fact, I, that gives me an idea to maybe perhaps do a uh, a perspective piece or um, some kind of uh, you know policy brief on, on it. And so uh, that's our. This has already been very very productive, and uh, um, I am in the process of setting up a a, a think tank. Uh, with uh, three verticals, one of which will have to do with um, uh, with crypto, blockchain, and distributed ledger technologies. And uh, they, you know, as um, you know, I, I'd, I'd love to hear people's thoughts on this. But uh, there are a lot of assumptions that are fundamental 
that kind of underlie a lot of the things that we do. So for example, you know, to decentralize, what does that mean in, 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 in the first place? Is that a good thing or is that a bad thing? And what, what inspires this to, uh, to start off with? And uh, there are a lot of um, you know, fundamental assumptions that have not really been um, sort of discussed. And I, um, you know, Gordon and I had uh, you know, uh, uh, many conversations uh, about, about these uh, issues. And so, so this, um, the question relates to that actually. What, what do you see, Ralph, as the, the future of uh, decentralization. So we've been talking about, you know, uh, this topic uh, for some time now. But um, if we were to, you know, kind of extend this to the logical extension, right? What would be an interesting uh, sort of a, a vision for for the future? Is this some kind of a brave new world, you know, where um, um, we we hey, professor, you're you're doing what smart people do. What's that? Cont cont contain your question in one succinct sentence. Go. All right. What is the, what do you see? So okay, two, two succinct questions. One, um, one, uh, one question. What do you see as the future of a decentralization? And two, what is an interesting logical? Oh, sorry. What is an interesting uh, sort of a use case that? Uh, or what are some of the examples of interesting use cases uh, that you see with uh, with blockchain? Good. That's it. Good. First, uh, Professor, please block the 10th of October in the mm -hmm. evening. I need you on stage because your voice is amazing. Uh, oh, thank he, you. He's a great right. singer, by the way. And I will host the next event on the 10th of October in Dubai. And um, I want you there. Okay, oh, now, just so you know, have you, have you heard Marco sing? No, I didn't. It, it is shockingly good, and I'm not being sarcastic. Okay. So get, get them both on stage and I'll be in the audience because if I sing, people's eyes will bleed. But just trust me. <laughs> but we Marco, need a band. <laughs> yeah, so just, these are good people. But anyways, go, go ahead, please. Good. And then to your questions, Professor. Um, I, I don't count me to the smart people. So I always only quote other people's because I don't have own own thoughts on that. And you mm. know, Ritalik said, um, decentralization is, for example, not taking the taxi companies out of the industry. It takes Uber out of the industry. Mm. So what, what I really believe is um, a lot of the value we are creating today in all of our businesses worldwide is made by middlemen. And when we are able to, to distribute the value which is created further to those who are really producing the value, then we will be successful. So it's about distribution of wealth. Uh, and you know, um, yesterday I saw something interesting. Um, it was also a social media post and there was before COVID, there was worldwide one person with a wealth of more than a trillion dollar. Mm -hmm. uh, after COVID or in the middle of COVID where we are right now, it's already 11 persons worldwide on wow. that. So it's, it's going in the wrong direction. Uh, we are decentralizing or we are centralizing wealth and not decentralizing wealth. And uh -huh. you know, when I when I heard the first time about an universal income idea, I uh -huh. thought, what a bullshit. Uh -huh. <laughs> I, I thought, what the fuck, what a bullshit. But <laughs> I I really believe we have to think in total new, total different models, how we are able to distribute the world which is here worldwide a little bit better uh, and when we are able with with the decentralized world to support that instead of more centralizing more decentralizing then we are successful uh, interesting and, and then professor was it was your second question covered in there uh so the um, yeah the, uh, in, the in use case, case. Mm. I mean, the, the use cases 
are all service oriented jobs worldwide. Mm -hmm. you, you know, today, for example, let's take someone who's producing a special quality of coffee in, in South America. Yeah? Mm -hmm. How cool is that when we are able to tokenize the coffee and when I drink my cup of coffee and say, I really like that. I want one cent of my, let's say in Switzerland, $4 I paid for the espresso. I want that one cent of this is going to the producer hmm. uh, to, to make the business direct and to take out all of the middlemen for that transaction. Hmm. I, I can give my appreciation to those gentlemen or those people who created it. Uh, and this is cutting out the middleman. It's, it's not that I know where the bones, uh, where the coffee has been made. It's more about, hey, they took their time to work on that and they probably get $50 a month today. And when we can contribute directly there and take mm -hmm. out everyone on the supply chain, uh, mm -hmm. that would be very cool in my opinion. Uh, I like it. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna switch to my favorite favorite Swiss last Dubai attorney, Arena Healer. And you gotta unmute yourself so we can hear your your powerful voice. Hi, hi everyone. I I am stuck in meetings all day, but I could not miss this episode of you know my favorite people presenting about my favorite subjects such as Dubai and Switzerland and um, so here I am um, saying hello to all of you and I wanted to and I'm please forgive me if that was covered but I wanted Ralph to uh, as an um, an outsider who's becoming an insider of Dubai to list top five negatives that uh, Dubai can improve in order to become the crypto hub, which I think we deserve to be. And because we all can talk about how good and beautiful everything is, but let's be real, there's a lot of uh, things that we can improve. So what would be, what would be your top five negatives that Dubai should work on very heavily on? The, the top five negatives. You know, uh, Irina, I like your question, but I hate to be negative. Uh, um, so first of all, I'm very positive. I think Dubai has everything we need to build it there. But number one is, is for sure, as long as we still need it, uh, we have to improve the banking in, in Dubai at the end of the day. Um, Number two is the air condition is too cold in Dubai. I always ah. get it cold. Uh, uh, no, I mean, to, to be honest, uh, on the number two side, uh, you know, there are a lot of regulations going on there and a lot of good ideas how to regulate companies, but really executed on that, how to regulate them. We don't have it now. Uh, so we need to execute on that. And this is not only Dubai, by the way, these are a lot of different countries in the world. So banking, executing on regulation. Yeah. Um, what is number three? Keeping out the bullshitters of Dubai. <laughs> okay, that's a very good point. How do well, we do yeah, that? Yeah, how, how do you do, how do, you do, uh, do I, that? I'm to jump in with the agreement. I, how do you... For both of you, since you're both sort of in there, how do you spot it and then navigate it and not overly offend people in the process? The problem with Dubai, as Ralph has mentioned several times, everybody is the greatest, everybody is the biggest, everybody has 10 trillion of assets under management, and everybody is the second cousin to the biggest royalty in the biggest nearby country. And mm -hmm. that happens all the time. So how, do, like, I don't know, how do you navigate through that, Ralph? We put it's arena my, on border control. It's <laughs> on my side. It's we gut can't afford feeling. Her. It's gut feeling. And if someone, you know, the the guys are usually the biggest and the greatest who are not talking about that they are the biggest and the greatest. Uh, 
and uh, I navigate through that if someone is starting on that side. But you know, there's there's a lot of scam going on in Dubai, a lot of uh, a lot of stuff, and we just need to be quick to get them out of the space and uh, to to point on that. And and that's a small that's a small line you go because just if you don't like someone he's not a scammer yeah? and sometimes people misunderstand that a little bit and uh, there's there's one thing do you like someone and the other thing is he's scamming people so i i'm only with three at the moment yeah? um banks executing on regulations getting out the scammers um Number four and number five is the air condition is too cold and getting cheaper wine. Uh, cheers on that. More I don't have. Uh, what about? Okay, I just have to say this is exactly the same problem we have in the Cayman Islands. Yeah. Okay, that's good. The wine and the air conditioning. No less air condition. It's always too cold in in every. What about? Yeah, I know that. Also, actually, Arena, hold on one second, Sam. Um, I think you're new. I think you're a new guest. Just uh, show your face so we know who we're talking to. Hi. He, he, he made an interesting comment. He said, "I would like to comment. I've been here 20 years and speak the local language." So, Arena, stay stay on to comment. But I just want to bring Sam into the conversation. Sam, go ahead. No, first of all, um, to be honest, I learned a lot in that uh, almost 45 minutes being on that Zoom call. Uh, so, thank you for all of you. And um, uh, just to since Dubai became the center of the uh, communication now. Um, we should not forget that Dubai is just started yesterday. And for a country or destination which is so young, um, I think they still have the credit to make improvement and mistakes. But comparing to a city or a destination that have been grown so fast at the country itself, within a speed, they're very fast as well in making commitments of we have done a mistake and to correct them and make mm -hmm. as well, let me say, the necessary steps to do the right steps to being better, more efficient, and as well, more successful. Dubai itself, with Abu Dhabi, obviously, they are absolutely business-oriented, and the leadership are focused on the local success to be exported to the, uh, let me say, international success, and are welcoming everybody to do that. And I hear quite often people like to criticize, and, um, you know, Dubai offers everybody an opportunity who likes to stay and likes the rules. You don't like it, you don't need to stay. So that is actually that's, the only change you can make for yourself. Fair. That is not fair. Stay, yeah. if you don't like it, you don't stay, get out of no, it. No, 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 I didn't say that. If you, you have in life, have excuse me, I didn't finish my well, sentence. Well, all right, Rina, let, let him finish so I can hear what he's yeah, saying and, and then respond. Out. In life, wherever you position yourself, for example, Ralph just described how Zook is. So he actually put his personal advantage of being based there and being based in Dubai with business and private. So it could have been in Miami, it could have been in Amsterdam, it could have been whatever. Every city has something to offer, which is more a plus for me personally and or for somebody else. So it depends on your own opinion. What I like doesn't mean that, for example, the lady likes or somebody else likes. So there is no general concept fitting everybody. There's only your own concept to be able to adjust or adapt to the destination where you go. Within the business environment, within the community, within the opportunities, within the laws, within the whatever, whatever we discuss. So you have to create your own fingerprint within the platform you're going to be, let me say, work in. And then afterwards you decide, do you like it or not? So it's not a criticism of whoever criticized something, but it's a criticism to yourself if you decide to allow that what you don't like to attach you or to hit you if you don't make the move away from it. So it depends on an own character, own opinion and own, but we can't generalize. So in the end of the day, we talked about a lot of technologies, opportunities, future, whatever. But the human being is the only one who's going to do the business. And you have to locate yourself in the center of the happening. And each center is your own environment. So uh, let me throw something in there. I, like, I, I, I was a dilettante in Dubai before now getting serious about it because I just didn't know it well enough to, to evaluate for my life. And I, I asked a lot of people who I trust who have different points of view about, you know, what is this place? Is it some superficial Las Vegas where everyone talks and nothing actually happens? Is it a place where you can get a lot of stuff done? Like, what is it? 
And um, Sam, to your point, I, I kind of came to the place that, you know, you can really waste a lot of time, a lot of money in Dubai if you want to waste a lot of time, a lot of money, but you can also make a ton of money and get healthy and make good friends and, and get, you know, you know what done. It, it kind of, it, it's like a diamond. I mean, you can turn it around and get different facets for your life. And it, you can also get different experiences depending on the day. In, in, unlike some other places where it's just you know, boringly consistent, though, I had a friend who's sort of an insider say, you know, if you want it to be, it can be some hyper capitalist meritocracy where you it's brutally competitive at a certain level. But if you're cool with that, you can do great. And, you know, just to be super blunt, you say, you know, the, the, the no go areas are imposing it's religious disputes slash imposing religion and others and also local politics. You know, as, as long as you can manage, you know, stay, stay clear to those, you're fine. And just remember you're a guest. I'm like, okay, I can, you know, that's cool. Like I got a big mouth and a big mind on these topics, but I don't need to go to Dubai to talk about them. You know, I can go do that in Los Angeles. So I, I don't know, for, for, for me personally, it works. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, Dubai, Dubai is not a place where you can make out of Dubai or through Dubai money. To people, if they come from abroad, they should choose Dubai as a great destination as the platform for the to be able to navigate your business and as well life, so whatever you want uh, around the rest of the world. It's a great environment where you have free, a f great freedom to work, to be creative, yeah. to do things. Usually, in a couple of destinations, you can't do. So, Dubai is an end of the day a city. You know, it's not a country. The Emirates right. is a country. But you are surrounded by so many opportunities in other countries which are just growing up, just waking up. I mean, uh, we heard a lot of things about Saudi Arabia, but what they're doing the, uh, on the other side for business and other things, it's amazing. In Africa, there are opportunities which are crazy, but they're all young born. And they need people probably like us, like others, to guide, to advise, to establish, to make aware of corrections. And they are actually thankful for it. That's why they call, have so many advisors and consultants um, I, I mean, uh, which, and they listen to it and they're correct and they admit they don't keep it on for 10 years until they make a call. They sit together and tomorrow, tomorrow the call is made and they do mistakes and they correct them again, which is good. And we learn out of that all together. Dubai is an opportunity for, uh, to, to do things, but it's not like something you should focus on where you get out of Dubai rich because this kind of right. gold digger thinking is over since a long time. It's a place where you can express yourself, you can safety, you can live nicely, and you can do things what CV Labs, for example, is aiming for. And I can see there's a great opportunity and chance uh, to, to make it happen, what uh, Ralph just uh, explained before. Okay, Angus, you're your new guest. Would you raise your hand? Um, do you want to unmute yourself and show your smiling face and comment? Or Angus, rather? Uh, you're, you're on mute, my friend. Okay. So uh, thank you for a great call, gentlemen. I really appreciated listening. And I'm in Dubai. I'm Scottish. I'm British. And it's a pleasure to be on this call. My last company has, for Switzerland has been in... My last company for five years was in Switzerland. So I do understand the value of the Swiss jurisdiction. I think we all understand the network effect. Dubai has probably the only place in the world that it's open. I lived in Dubai for 20 years. So just to conclude constructively, moving on to the next point, this was a very valuable call and I really appreciate your time. I just want to say thanks very much for recording the call as well so that we can share the learning with others. And uh, I congratulate you guys in CVVC for you know, what you're doing uh, in general and for, what you're, uh, for the events that we're going to have here, the epic events, because as I think as Gordon or somebody just said a minute ago, most things is going to be shut down this year. So there's very few people traveling except people in the blockchain and crypto world and all the events are going to happen in Dubai in October. So I look forward to meeting you all and just to say thank you. That was my main point. So we can argue a lot of these points back and forward. We're in a global decentralized business. That's, that's the point. And the whole point about this is how to get the, ahead of the, the regulation. So thank you very much. That's all from my side. Thank you. Uh, uh, Irina, if you have a well, final comment, I'll, I'll give you the final word before we get back to Ralph, and then we're going to close it up. I, I feel like you got something to say, because you're you. 
Um, well, no. I, I just kind of think that uh, we all love Dubai. That's why we are there. Um, we are um, most of us are long term residents, but you can't be always wearing rosy glasses and thinking everything is wonderful and everything is great because this way you cannot improve. And the difference of opinions is important in order for progress to take place. And it's also important to highlight the bads and the and the worst and uh, in order for progress to take place. For example, there was a lot of outcry internationally that Dubai is the most expensive place to form a company. Um, Angus, we can see your beautiful living room. So if you want to turn, turn off your camera. Um, and uh -huh. that's really, um, uh, so now there is a lot of free zones who are offering really, really good prices for companies in corporation. Hadn't there been uh, for the outcry, hadn't there been for a lobbying effort, nothing would happen. You know, some things that uh, Ralph is doing with, his, uh, with the crypto center, you know, there is an outcry that the banks are not the most helpful. So the uh, DMCC crypto center is now entering into partnerships with banks in order to, you know, provide better services better better access for mm -hmm. entrepreneurs so you can't always say everything is great and if you don't like it get out of here leave that's that's not uh, probably the most uh, uh, the most democratic approach to things and um, so I need I still need two more points um, uh, how we can improve and uh, if I were to name them there would be probably the lack of talent uh, if you look at Switzerland, I mean, there's beautiful tech talent that we've got here. There's polytechnical universities uh, producing top, top talent. If you look at Ukraine, the, the tech talent they're, they're producing is just a, a, a amazing. In Dubai, I think we lack the tech talent, and you need tech talent in order to become a tech hub. And the other thing is the VC uh, uh, space. What do you think, Ralph? Can, can there be uh, some improvement on the VC space? Uh, um, uh, do, does companies to grow babies, you know, baby companies need money to grow. What do you think there? Um, I, I fully agree on both of that, what you said. Uh, regarding the talent, I, I told before, I saw a lot of talent moving this last year to Dubai, also tech talent and, uh, and entrepreneurs and so on. And on the VC side, I mean, Draper going home, came to Dubai, chose a former dear friend yep. of us. Uh, we are moving to Dubai. And, you know, in Dubai, there's a lot of non-VC or non-professional VC uh, money around. So um, I think beside having uh, venture capital there, it's how to educate people in what to invest and in what not because I have seen suggestions to invest growing in Dubai so big where I really say, why do you guys put your money there? Uh, and then we are again at the scammers level at the end of the day. Um, no, but both points are well, um, very, very well, um, Irina. Both is good. And on the, on the other side, I want to put a disclaimer here. Sam Katiela, who was speaking before, uh, sits on the board, uh, on the advisory board of CV Labs in Dubai or on our global advisory board. He's a good friend of mine and uh, he helps me to navigate through, uh, through the UAE and the Middle East in general. Um, Fantastic. I like it. All right, guys, I, I, think, we, I think we've had a, a rich and varied show. Uh, Ralph, I just want to thank you so much for making the time. I know you're a busy guy. I know you're traveling. I know you're been doing this for a generation or more. You're like an energizer bunny. And I think since we seem to be generationally similar, I'm, I'm, in, I'm inspired. So just appreciate you, appreciate the time. Um, I, I wanted to quickly answer two sure. questions from the chat. Uh, Sandra, uh, Ariel Ludi is one of the 20 founding partners at the Chat Club, I assumed before. So I know him, he was speaking at my events and and he is one of the guys I trusted. And the other question was uh, University of Basel. Um, I'm sitting in the advisory board of the University of Basel. Uh, we handed out the doctor title to Mr. Vitalik Buterin, by the way. There. Wow. Uh, was a funny evening. And um, of course, we are we are helping to to educate people with the University of Basel and with several other universities in, in Switzerland. So if someone uh, needs a job opportunity in the blockchain space, uh, 
just reach out to me. You can find me on LinkedIn. I'm the guy with the pink pullover. Um, I'm there. And um, thank you for the opportunity to talk today. Uh, really a pleasure. And uh, looking forward to have you end of August, Gordon, at our Crypto Rally Summit in Zug, Switzerland. I'm excited. And, and for the guys not in Switzerland, but in Dubai, put in the 10th of October in your calendar in Dubai. There will be some things going on. Very interesting. Looking forward to that. I like it. Sander, as I like to say, my good friend, do you want to land this plane? Yeah, sure. I think, Gordon, because I was watching also the, the, the live stream on YouTube, we had a lot of attendants also there. A lot of people are happy that we're back and that we're happy that we're back with a great guest like Ralph. And I really appreciate yeah. Ralph that you spent some time with us. I think the, the interaction between the audience that were here live and yourself was really good. So can we please get you back in one of the upcoming shows also? We always appreciate, you know, industry experts and professionals sharing their ideas, sharing their vision. This is what it's all about. And thank you to all our guests who were also part of the show. And also one of our biggest fans is Marco Ano Anibali. So Marco, thank you for joining. And Gordon, good to see you again. Let's say yeah, yeah, well, you're gonna see me on your time zone pretty soon. Let's let's schedule our new upcoming crypto Wednesday show. But for now, I would like to say thank you, everybody, and especially to Ralph. Thank you for taking the time. And we all look forward to seeing you in the near future. Thank you, everybody, and stay Very healthy. Good. All right. Peace out. Thank Thanks. you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.